Hey everybody, uh, obviously this is not the church. Uh, we did not record our service this past Sunday and the intention was to record it on a Monday, the sermon on Monday or, or something like that, but we had a huge snowstorm. I had the stomach bug and so this is what we're going to get today, me in our dining room uh, going through Joshua chapter two. But it, it is what it is and we're gonna go with it. We're in this series called Strong and Courageous at Age 40 where we are looking at the, the life of Joshua and comparing it to the truth that God has this place that he will, is calling all of us to go to in every aspect of our life. Uh, aspect of our life, like a relationship with Him, our 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 place in a church, in school, at work, in our in our marriage, in our homes. God is is designed us, and so He knows where we need to go. He's leading us to that place. But in order to get that place, we're going to have to realize that there's something standing between where we are and where God wants to take us, and that's all these things that are put there by the evil one. These things that sometimes are well-defined, but other times it's simply just this fog of mystery that we don't quite know what it is that's, that's going to be standing in front of us. And yet, the call for us is the same call that God had to Joshua, who stood before the promised land. And God said, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to take care of everything. You're going to end up in here, but I need, I need two things from you. I need you to be strong and courageous. In Joshua chapter 1, we see God defines how Joshua does that. He says, be strong and very courageous, and then he points out that this is done through being obedient to him, meditating on his word, letting the law ever be on his lips, never turning to it from the right to the left. This, this idea that the obedience and a life of obedience will produce strength and courage. So if we want to be strong and courageous in our journey with God, we, we need to take the step of being obedient to God, of digging into his word, of following his decrees and what he wants us to do. Now, we look at the response from Joshua. Immediately after this happened, Joshua turns to the people there. And he says, it's a so Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God has given you for your own. So immediately after this conversation where God says, I promise you, Joshua, you're going to get to this place. You're, these people will follow you. I will give everything into your hands. Just be strong and courageous. Joshua is strong and courageous. And he, he turns to the officers and he says, tell everybody it's time to go. In three days, we're going into this land. And now where they are is really close to this place called Jericho. And so Joshua has something that he wants done in those three days as everybody prepares to enter into the promised land. And that's where we pick up in Joshua chapter 2. It says, Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and near the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. So this is a pretty loaded verse, right? It's a problematic verse. Most of us are focusing there on the last part of that verse, but the truth is the entire verse is a bit problematic because there's some flashbacks that would be happening with where they are and what they're doing before we ever get to where they ended up. This place, Shittim, is a place that the people of Israel have been before, and it's a place where, ironically, they prostituted themselves to the women of Moab, the Moabite women. They, 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 they lusted after them, they, they intermarried with them, they, they had relations with them, and because of that, they started following gods that wasn't the true God, and, and they were punished because of it. And so they, they've come back to this place. It's kind of like when you go back to your hometown and you see all the sites that you really like to see, but you don't go to those places that bring back bad memories, right? So like you go to the high school and you talk about this is where I went to prom, you stay away from the elementary school where the fifth graders stuff you in the locker. This is kind of the same thing, that they're in the this place and it's just bad memories this is a place of disobedience not only that but not only where they are but what they're doing is a callback to something else that's happened in the life of the 
people of Israel. Right before, or years before this, Moses had got to the edge of the promised land, had sent in 12 spies into the promised land to scout it out. Ten of the 12 come back and say, even though all 12 of them say it's, it's exactly as God says it's going to be, 10 of the 12 saw how many people there were there. They got scared, and so they embellished and said, we can't possibly take over this land. And while Joshua and Caleb, the other two spies, said, let's go in, the people of Israel listened to the ten. And Spicer said it was big and it was scary. And so this led them to take a detour, this giant circle around, waiting for an entire generation to die before they're allowed to get to this point that they're in now where Joshua is entering into the promised land. So we're in a place that has bad memories, doing something that last time it happened didn't go that great. And then we get to the very last part and it says the very first night that these spies are in the city of Jericho, they end up at the home of Rahab, who was a prostitute. Now, we have no inclination, or nor shall we ever think that something happened that was less than reputable, but it's, it's not a great look. However, if you, you look at maybe why they went there, it's it, it was possibly not just a home, but like a tavern or a well-traveled place. And so if you are a spy, this, this is where you would probably want to end up, because you could overhear conversations that were going on. So this is where the spies end up for the night. But we see that the whole the, the whole operation gets off to a pretty rough start. Verse 2 it says the king of Jericho was told Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have had they have come to spy out the whole land. So there's a, a time a few years ago, I was working at the office, I had our two boys with us, and I needed to get work done, so I told them, go play hide and seek. I don't care where you go, just, just go play hide and seek and basically leave me alone. Well, my youngest son ends up in my office, he gets a bin and he puts it over him to hide in, and my oldest went to count. The issue with the bin is, well, as you can see, it was clear. I didn't have the heart to tell him it wasn't a good idea. Of course, my oldest comes immediately in and finds him. My youngest accuses him of cheating. They start arguing. My work is done, and we went home. Um, but the, the truth is, the spies, the, they don't seem very good at their job. Because the night that they are there, the king of Jericho says there are spies in this land. And not only do they have the, just the idea that maybe they're spies in this land, they know exactly where they are. They're at the home of Rahab. And so the king of Jericho sends this message to Rahab and says, you need to give them up. But something happened here. We see in Joshua chapter 4, beginning, or Joshua chapter 2, verse 4, it says, But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they came from. At dusk, when it was time for, for the to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up. With them, But she had taken them up to the roof and had hidden them under the stalks of flax that she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. So Rahab had found out somehow that these people were spies. Obviously, they weren't very good at it if the king knew about it. So it probably wasn't a mystery to the woman whose home they were in, who they were either. But she had done something before the, the representatives from the king had ever got to her house. She had hidden them on top of the roof under these stalks of flax. And she makes up a story. She says, I don't know where they came from. I, they, they left to, to beat the closing of the city gate. And, and, and then we see that the pursuers leave. And as soon as they leave, the gate is shut, which meant that Rahab gave them the illusion that they had just left because at the at dusk the, the city gate shuts so that no wild animals or foreign adversaries would come in in the middle of the night and, and so they get, she gives them the impression they just left so they pursue after them they go after them and look for these Isra uh, these Israelite spies then we see that she goes up on the roof to has a converse, to have a conversation with the spies it says, before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for when you came out of Egypt and what you 
dried up the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites, east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard him, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God, is God in heaven above and on the earth below. She says, there's this reality in Jericho, a reality that the 10 spies from that previous story had forgotten about. And that is that this group of people, this nation, this land had heard about all the things that had happened with the people of Israel since leaving Egypt. They had heard how God had led them through the Red Sea on dry ground. They, they heard about how these mighty countries were, people were wiped out completely by, by these people. And she says, everyone's melting in fear because of you. That, that gives us the indication of why the king of Jericho was so adamant about immediately finding the spies that they needed to get them out of there because they, they were all afraid of them. But there was something that set Rahab apart. Rahab came up, to, come up, came up with a conclusion that the rest of the people didn't. That very last part in verse 11 says that she believed, she said, because your God is the God in heaven above and on the earth below. Through just hearing about everything that they had done, everything that God had done for them, she came to this conclusion that their God was the true God. See, Jericho is the city in the bigger part of this land called Canaan, a land that had multiple gods and worshipped different things and, and had different idols. And, and yet she makes this profound statement. I, I, basically, I'm helping you because I believe your God is the true God. Rahab is an example of faith. Example of faith, not just used by people today, but people in the New Testament. The writer of Hebrews cites her alongside mighty people of the faith by mentioning her in what we call the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31, it says, By faith the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. She had faith in God. She had faith in their God, the, the God of the Israelites. And she says, I believe that your God is the true God. And that's why I am helping you. So she helps them. And then she enters into a bargaining with them about what to do next. She says, now, then please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I've shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives or your lives, the minister her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So they enter into this agreement. She, the, this agreement, she says, I, I've saved you. Will you save me and those who are in my home? And from the outset of it, or just looking at it, glimpsing at it, we seem like this is a pretty good deal. If somebody went through the effort of hiding us on the roof, we would probably expect to be able to protect them. And so we don't bat an eye at all at what happens here. The, the issue is that there is uh, a, a section of scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 7 where God gives his people instructions about entering into the promised land and he tells them to swear no oaths, to, to make no promises, no deals with those nations who are there. Because they're godless nations, they need to drive them out. They don't need to make any, any special deals with them. And, and, and so they, here they are making a deal with a Canaanite woman, but there is a big difference. We do see later on that the people of Israel make a deal with the nation. They let them stick around and they become a thorn in their side. And, and it shows why God wanted to drive them out. But there's something different here. That they're not making a deal with a godless nation. They're making a deal with a faithful woman who believes in their God. And so the spies have no problem whatsoever. They say, yes, our lives for your lives. We refuse. As long as you don't tell people what's going on, we will protect you. So the woman sends them, Rahab sends them on their way. And so, so she let them down by a rope through the window for the house excuse me, she lived in was part of the city walls. She said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there for three days until they return and then go on your way. 
So she gives them instructions. This is where you're going to go. Go up on the hills. Look. See when the pursuers come back. You'll know that it's free for you to then go back to your people. And then we get a callback to a conversation that they had before they were lowered down the window. It kind of goes out of order here. They're not shouting back Rahab in the window and everybody else down on the, the two spies down on the ground hollering back and forth in the middle of the night. They had already had this conversation, but look what it says. It says, now the men had said to her, this oath that you made a swear by, or made a swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land, you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and your mother, your brothers, and all your family into the house. If any of them go outside the house into the streets, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath that you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you said. And so she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. So they have this conversation, and the spies tell her that as they need to put the scarlet cord in the window. It signifies this is the home that is to be preserved. It is supposed to be taken care of. They tell her, listen, if, if any of the people who you want saved walk outside this house while this is happening, we're, we're not responsible for what happens to them. If something happens to them and they are in this house, then it's on our heads. Rahab, here's the deal. You do not tell anyone what we're doing, and we will protect those who are in this house. If you tell anyone, then our oath is removed, and we're, when we lay waste to everything else, you all will be included in that. She says, I believe. I, I believe you agreed. This is what needs to happen. And so they go up on a hill, and they wait for three days in verses 22 and 23. It says, when they left, they went into the hill, stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. So they go, they wait, they see the pursuers come back to the city of Jericho, and they know that that's their green light to now go back to the Jordan, to ford the Jordan, to go back to the other side, to Shittim, where everybody's waiting. And they go up to Joshua, and they tell him everything that happened. Now, my kind of way of thinking is they had three days to come up with the story and how not to leave with. Well, Joshua, the first night we were there, we went to this prostitute's house, right? They probably eased into that statement, but, but they tell them everything. They tell Joshua everything that happened. So the question you might have at this point is, so what does this have to do with being strong and courageous? What does that have to do with Because, well, Rahab may be an example of strength and courage. She, she stood up and, and defied the king, and she, she told the, the, the people of Israel, uh, the Israelite spies, hey, well, I'll protect you, you protect me. And, yeah, she's an example of faith and strength and courage, but our focus has been Joshua and the people of, of, the, of the Israelites. And so how, what does this have to do with strength and courage? Well, look at the very next verse, verse 24. It says, they said to Joshua, the spies said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. They said, look at this. This is happening. Everything that God said that was going to happen, it's going to happen. Everybody's scared of us. The, the Lord is going to give this into our hands. So the report from these spies come back to what Joshua and Caleb, the original good spies back in the day, came back and said, hey, we can do this. They come back and say, Joshua, we can do this. We can do this. And, and how do they know this? Because Rahab showed them that her faith and showed, her, showed them hospitality and told them, hey, everyone here is scared of you. You your God is the true God. It was Rahab's help that led them to feel confident, to feel emboldened, to feel, well, strong and courageous. So last week we talked about where strength and courage come from. They come from obedience to God. But there's a second part to this. Strength and courage does come from, they are fruit of an obedient life to God, but strength and courage is also aided by the help from those that God put in our journey. Strength and courage is aided by those that God puts along our path, along our journey towards where he's leading us, who, who invest in us and take 
care of us. Listen, it is, it is possible for just you and God to, through your obedience to him, to, to, to get to that place of promise in, in your life and, and to live an obedient life and to be strong and courageous. It is, it is it's possible for you to just do that with God. But it's a probability that God is going to use other people in your journey to help you remain strong and courageous. Because that's the way God has done this from the beginning. He's designed us to where we don't do all of this on our own. It goes back to day six. Day six of creation, he creates mankind. The very first man is Adam. He creates Adam and he gives Adam a list of things to do about how to take care of the land and the animals and things like that. And he gives him something not to do. Do not eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Something to do, something not to do. And then immediately God says this in Genesis 2.18. It is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Immediately after giving him a task, he puts someone in his path that says it's not good for him to be alone. So this will be a helper who will help him. And throughout the Bible, we see people called by God to his plan and his purpose have people around them who speak truth into their lives, who come alongside them, who help them in their journeys. That continues through the New Testament. And there's a word in the New Testament, Elion, and it means one another. And it shows up a hundred different times in the New Testament, and, and it defines life in this Christian community. Throughout the New Testament, we see things like love one another, be hospitable to one another, care for one another. In the context of a meal, wait for one another, carry one another's burdens, show kindness to one another, forgive one another. We have this list of all these one another's that God is leading or calling the church to be for one another. And the truth is, if we try to live life on our own, we miss out on that. We miss out on the, the love, encouragement, correction that can come from people that God is putting in our path if we try to just do this by ourselves. I know there's a lot of you who are watching this, and I'm, I'm included in this group, who we would, we would classify ourselves as more than just introverts, but, but maybe loners, where we, we just try to do things on our own, try to figure things out on our own. Don't try to burden anybody else with anything that's happening in our life. Just try to go through life on our own. And I don't know about you, but I know that when I do that and I don't allow the people that God is leading, putting in my life to invest into me, I end up in a place that's far from where God wants me to be. See, there are people in our path who God is putting there, who, who God wants to, to put there to encourage us to correct us when we're going wrong, to spur us on, to, to hold us up when we're weak. There, there's people that God is putting in our path every single day, and we need to be open to them. Just as the Israelite spies had to be open to Rahab, who would be the last person you would ever think would be somebody of full of faith, but, but they were open to Rahab. And we too need to be that way. To the whoever God is using in our life, to direct our path. I want to encourage you who are watching today in your journey towards where God is leading you in all the aspects of your life. In order to maintain your strength and courage, we need to accept the help from those that God puts in our life. Be open to it. Think about your life as a boardroom, or at least the, the guiding mechanism of your life as a boardroom. And Jesus is sitting at the head of the table. He's the one who was in charge. But, but what the truth is that, that God wants you to put people around that table who are there for a moment, who are there for a lifetime, who will help you be strong and courageous. Look for people who have the same qualities as Rahab, who believe that the Lord is the God of heaven and the God of earth. Look for the people who believe in where your obedience to God is taking you and allow them to invest in you. Allow them to 
love you. Allow them to correct you. That None of us wants to do that. It takes humility, but allow them to be part of your life so that you can maintain strength and courage. We need to be willing to accept the help of those that God is putting in our life to help us towards that place that God's leading us. But I also want to challenge us to do something else. See, when we talk about our journey, it becomes singular, and, and sometimes we think everything about this is singular, and yet the truth is that God allows our different journeys to converge. Sometimes for a day a week at church, sometimes for a season of life, or sometimes for decades, sometimes for a lifetime. And in those moments where our paths converge, God is leading us both to our individual place where we are called to go, but he's using the converging of those paths for an opportunity for not just us to accept help, but for us to be the help in other people's journeys. See, what we'll find is if we're that help for others, we'll end up in a better place to going towards where God's leading us to be because this is part of what we're called to do, love God and love others. Be willing to help. Be willing to love. Be willing to be patient. Be willing to encourage. Be willing to, in truth and love, correct. Be willing to be the help in other people's journeys. The truth is strength and courage. It does come from a life of obedience to God. Being obedient to God is a tough, tough task because we're fallen people. We chase after the things of our fleeting desires. And that's why we need others. And that's why we need to be the help in other people's lives as well. And so maybe this day and as you watch this and as you move on throughout your day, that maybe you can just sit and pause. You sit and pause and think about those that God's putting in your life. Think of how you can be open and who you're going to give that seat of influence to in, in your life. Think about the people in your life who God's leading you to invest in, to love, how you can be the help in other people's journeys as well. Today, as we read the story of Rahab, we're reminded of how others can be an asset to our strength and courage. Accept the help from others and be the help to others in their journeys as well.